Okay. Uh, over the next hour, I, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about fracking, of course, but I, I want to put it in some context. And where I'd like to start in doing that is to tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from. I read this book when I was 21 years old. The year was 1972. The book had just been published. Uh, it was a huge uh, seller. It, it uh, has been, up to this point, the best-selling environmental book so far, uh, The Limits to Growth. It was the report of a study, a computer modeling study, of the likely interactions between population growth, resource depletion, and environmental impacts. Uh, it was the first time anybody had, had tried to, to do this. And uh, they, they came to some rather startling conclusions. Their standard run scenario, which was basically just projecting forward into time the, the uh, existing trends, uh, showed a peak and decline in world industrial, industrial output sometime in the first half of the 21st century. Uh, the other scenarios tried to tweak those uh, input variables uh, in different ways, showing government policies to reduce population growth and consumption, uh, to restrain environmental impacts, and so on. And uh, all of these, these uh, efforts simply led to a, a delaying of the, of the peak and decline. So the idea that there were limits to world economic growth was a, a, uh, an unwelcome one in certain quarters, and so this book was widely derided, especially by mainstream economists. But in, uh, in recent years, the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization in Australia, which is Australia's main uh, scientific research institution, uh, has done a retrospective analysis of the limits to growth study from 1972 and came to this conclusion that the standard run or most pessimistic of the scenarios was actually closest to modeling the, uh, the evolution of, of the different variables over, over time. So the, the good news is we're right on track. But uh, how, how these limits to world growth are, are approaching is, uh, is, is perhaps a bit different than what was um, envisioned back in the early 1970s. And I think we can safely say at this point that it's mostly about energy in one way or another. So a little bit about energy. It's, uh, it's really important. In fact, it's... Uh, it's the essence of life, and it's certainly the essence of our economy. Most mainstream economists would say, well, energy is 10% you know, of, of GDP, so if, uh, if oil prices go up or if, if energy is constrained in other ways, then you know, we have at, at, at most a 10% hit on GDP. That's a very narrow way of thinking about energy because, in fact, of course, if, if the lights go out and there's no gasoline at the pumps, the economy doesn't decline by 10%. The economy goes away. It's 100% dependent on energy. Uh, we've been using energy forever, for at least as long as we've been human, actually as long as we've been biological organisms. And up until recent times, the last couple of hundred years, we use it, used it in renewable forms, mostly in the forms of food crops, uh, animal muscles, human muscles. All of that changed with the Industrial Revolution. Fossil fuels were completely unprecedented in all of human economic history. Energy dense, uh, inexpensive, portable. We were able to do things we could never have done previously. Uh, with a combination of fossil fuels and uh, a few 
inventions. We saw uh, massive expansion of manufacturing of consumer goods. Uh, suddenly, we were able to replace human labor in all sorts of ways with machines. In agriculture, for example, uh, prior to the Industrial Revolution, most people were farmers. And, um, and of course, this was, was, this was again a main, a main energy source for society, agriculture. And it took 70, 80 percent of the population farming in order to produce enough of an energy surplus to fund energy-wise a small minority of the population to live in cities and specialize in other occupations, uh, arts and crafts and soldiery and statecraft and all the rest. So suddenly, agriculture could be mechanized, freeing people up from the farms to move to cities, to engage in other occupations, to be uh, uh, newspaper editors or professors of medieval French literature or, you know, thousands and thousands of occupations. This was the birth of the middle class, really. Uh, manufacturing of labor-saving machinery in the form of vacuum cleaners and dishwashers and, and all the rest uh, freed up half the population, uh, women, to move out of, of the home into the workforce. Not a lot. Not move out of the home, but to, uh, to join the workforce. It's magical when you think about it. You know, the, nature did all the work of making fossil fuels. All we've had to do is, is dig down into the earth and, and free them up and burn them. Uh, if you've ever run out of gasoline in your car and had to push it a few feet off to the side of the road, you know how much work that is. Well, imagine pushing your car 20 or 30 miles. Sorry, I'm using US metrics here. Uh, that's really a lot of work, but we get that done for us with a single U.S. gallon of gasoline for which we in California are paying $4 and complaining. So six or eight weeks of hard human labor, which is what it would take to push that car for 20, 30 miles, we're getting for $4. That's incredibly cheap energy, and that's what has driven economic growth just over the last century or two. Uh, you know, previous centuries, civilizations were rising and falling, but daily life was pretty much the same from generation to generation for most people. All of that has changed profoundly. And we see the close correlation between GDP growth, energy consumption, and carbon emissions. Well, for all their economic benefits, there are a couple of serious problems with fossil fuels, one of which, of course, is that burning them is changing the climate, and changing the climate in ways that are not very favorable for the continua continuation of industrial society or human civilization in any form. Uh, from a policy standpoint, the world has pretty much accepted two degrees of warming as, as just, just fine and dandy, regardless of the fact that one degree of warming so far has led to uh, extreme weather events, which in turn impact uh, agriculture as well as other aspects of the economy. But are we really just on track for two degrees of warming? It may be that we are setting, uh, setting off self-reinforcing feedbacks that even with 450 parts per million of, of CO2, which is the, the, the current uh, policy um, target, if you will, um, could produce much higher degrees of warming. One of these feedbacks is the uh, melting of Arctic tundra and uh, methane hydrates. 
Methane, of course, is a much more powerful greenhouse gas, a more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. So as methane is released from uh, the Arctic uh, soils and waters, that drives even faster warming, which melts even more methane, releases even more methane. And so, again, a self-reinforcing feedback loop. And there's a lot of methane stored in the Arctic. Also, as the Arctic warms, uh, the North Polar ice cap is melting. Now, North Polar ice cap ref reflects a lot of uh, the sun's rays, uh, but as it melts, that opens up dark ocean water to absorb more heat from the sun, which causes the polar ice cap to melt even faster. Again, a self-reinforcing feedback. So are we on target or on track for two degrees of warming or four or six? No one knows at this point, but the indications are that the IPCC scenarios are too conservative. The, uh, the, the climate sensitivity to increased uh, increments of, of CO2 forcing, the climate sensitivity is greater than has been previously estimated. This is the emerging consensus among climate scientists. If this is the case, if we are headed to four or six degrees or more of warming, just with the amount of CO2 that has been em emitted so far and is almost certain to be emitted in the next 20 to, to 40 years, then we're in a pickle. But this is not the only problem with fossil fuels. There's also the problem that these are finite resources. Uh, and we've always known that in principle, but the assumption generally has been that this, this won't be a difficulty anytime soon. You know, maybe for future generations, decades and decades from now, there might be the problem of running out of one fossil fuel or another, but certainly not in our lifetimes. Well, no, we're not going to run out of any fossil fuel in our lifetimes or ever. I'll explain why in, in a little while. But that doesn't mean that the fact that these fuels are non-renewable and finite and depleting isn't a problem. We're seeing this first and foremost with oil, which is in many ways the, the economically pivotal, pivotal fossil fuel. Why? Because we use it for transportation and it represents 95% of transport energy, roughly speaking. Transportation is key to trade and trade is key to the economy as a whole. So really oil is, is uh, uh, the, the most essential of all energy sources from the standpoint of our economy. What's actually been happening with world oil production? Well, it had been on a, a steady upward track since, the, since we started using it back in the 1860s. With uh, one major hiccup back in the 1970s and early 80s when there were, there were political interruptions to the global oil supply, the oil shocks of the early 1970s and 79, the Iranian revolution later on and the, er and the earlier um, embargo of, um, instigated by the OPEC countries. But other, other than those instances, oil supply has grown at a, a pretty rapid and steady pace right up until about 2005. And for some reason, to, since 2005, the global oil supply has not grown nearly as, as quickly. Largely because the supply hasn't been growing, we've seen oil prices rise really dramatically from you know, $25 a barrel back in 2002 to the new normal of $100 a barrel and more, which is been since 
2011, 2012, and we're still there in 2014. Now, what's actually happening in the world of oil production to cause supply to flatten out and prices to rise dramatically? Well, the oil industry has been trying its level best to maintain increasing rates of production. You know, it, from 1998 to 2005, the industry in, invested $1.5 trillion in exploration and production, and that yielded almost 9 million barrels a day of new production. Okay, so uh, that's what we would expect to continue since 2005, but no, since 2005, the industry's invested $4 trillion, over twice as much, and that's yielded about a third as much in terms of increasing production rates. So this is indication of declining returns on investment in exploration and production. Now, where oil production actually has grown in the last few years is in a single category, and that's what the industry calls unconventionals. Uh, that category includes uh, tar sands from Canada, uh, tight oil produced by hydrofracturing in places like the Bakken Formation in North Dakota, the Eagle Ford Formation in South Texas, uh, deep water and ultra deep water drilling as in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, regular conventional oil production, mostly onshore and mostly vertical wells in conventional uh, reservoirs, that hasn't grown. So what, we, what we've seen here is of the $4 trillion that the industry has invested in the last eight years, only about $350 billion of that has gone into unconventionals. And that $350 billion in un, uh, inv investment in unconventionals has yielded almost all of the actual increase, paltry as it has been, in world oil production. The over $3 trillion, $3.5 trillion that the in industry has invested in conventional oil production has yielded flat to declining production. So the industry has invested $3.5 trillion in producing zero new net oil production from conventional sources. So it's all about unconventionals now. That the industry is turning away from investment in conventional oil because there's not that much more to be found and produced in that category and turning toward unconventionals. But as the price goes up to justify production from marginal sources, this has an economic impact. We've seen over the past few years that oil prices at $100 a barrel and higher are a break on economic expansion. So this is an example of the kinds of limits to growth that we are already seeing and will increasingly see as time goes on. But the industry, the oil industry, actually needs even higher prices than $100 a barrel to justify going after the last worst prospects. For example, Arctic oil. There's been a lot of talk in recent years about how, well, with the, with the North Polar ice cap melting, this opens up the opportunity for drilling in Arctic waters, in deep water and ultra deep water, to produce oil and, and natural gas that are, that are present there. But the industry's efforts so far, especially Shell, have been thwarted by the high costs and risks of operating in this very forbidding environment. So Shell has largely pulled out of its Arctic operations and nobody else really wants to go there until oil prices go higher. 
it's just not cost effective. The actual costs of oil exploration and production are rising at about 11% per year for the industry. But the market won't bear a higher price. As the, higher, as the price of oil nudges higher, what happens? Consumers in North America and Europe and Japan pull back on consumption. The Chinese are continuing to increase their consumption of oil, but North Americans, not so much. In the US, we're seeing uh, declining vehicle miles traveled. And we really haven't seen this before. Typically, in the US, every year, there's uh, historically, uh, there are more vehicles on the road, and people are driving further. They live further from where they, they uh, from where they uh, work or shop, and they make longer trips. But no, that's not happening anymore. Young people are deciding not to own cars. Uh, so, U.S. oil consumption has been flatlined or in some years declining in these recent years as oil prices have, have risen. And so the market is not supporting increasing oil prices. So therefore, the industry, which needs higher oil prices, is actually pulling back on investment in upstream projects, exploration and new production prospects. And this is a very new phenomenon. This has just been happening in the last few months. So what this means is, almost certainly, in the next year or two, we will start to see production declines in the category of conventional oil. So are the unconventionals going to be able to make up for those declines which may begin to become significant over the next four or five years? Well, that's, that's really a, a big question because, again, oil is, is key to the economy itself. The, uh, the majors, the, the Exxons, Shell, Chevron have been investing more and more and their production has actually been declining. If you look at the top 10 major oil companies, their, their total production has declined by about 25% in the last 10 years. So it's not up to the majors anymore. Most of the uh, drilling for unconventionals in the form of tar sands has not been happening among the majors. It's smaller companies that have been willing to take on more risk and more debt in order to go after these, these smaller and riskier deposits. But the claims that are being made for unconventional oil and also for a related resource, shale gas, are extraordinary. We've heard in just the last few years that the U.S. has 100 years, and it's sometimes even said 200 years, of cheap natural gas as a result of the advent of hydrofracturing. That the U.S. is becoming energy independent, that the U.S. is becoming the world's foremost oil producer again, as it was many, several decades ago, and that the expansion of the tar sands production in Canada can go on uh, almost indefinitely because the resource base is so large. So the claims are we no longer have anything to worry about in terms of fossil fuel supply. These are extraordinary claims given what I've just been telling you about what's happening, actually happening in the oil industry and the financials of the oil industry. So are these claims true? <clears throat> well, there are very extensive resources in terms of shale gas and tight oil in North America and elsewhere around the world. Uh, 
but are they going to, are these resources going to support those, those claims? Well, we've decided to do some research on that subject at, at, within my organization, Post Carbon Institute. We've, we determined, first of all, that the claims that are being made rest on some assumptions. Those assumptions are that there's relative uniformity among the various plays or geological formations that are likely to produce shale gas and tide oil, that there's relative uniformity among the plays and also within the plays. So within these relatively large geographic areas, you'll be able to drill almost anywhere and have relatively good success in terms of production and profit potential. Well, <clears throat> we, we decided to test these assumptions. We uh, bought the rights to drilling data on over 60,000 currently producing shale oil, or shale gas and tight oil wells uh, in the United States. Uh, the analysis was uh, done by one of our fellows, David Hughes, who's a British Columbian, uh, former chief geoscientist for the Canadian Geological Survey. We looked at the location of each well, the initial production rate of each well, and then followed the production rate of each well over time. What we found is that there's high variability between, in terms of resource quality, between these plays and also within plays. So that, uh, for example, in the Barnett shale gas play in Texas, which is uh, focused right around the city of Fort Worth, Texas, there's only a small area where initial production rates are high enough to justify the investment in drilling. That's not to say the only wells that have been drilled are in the, this core, small core area, but the wells outside that core area have not been profitable. So the industry, and I've, I've attended industry uh, presentations on uh, shale gas and, and tight oil, the industry representatives tend to say, well, look, here's the proof. The proof is in the production. Look at what's happening with this well and this well and this well. And what they're typically showing is results from the first and best wells drilled. And the assumption, again, is that uh, as companies move away from these core areas, they're going to get the same results. The data does not support that. Another thing we found is that uh, not only are initial production rates outside the core areas much lower, but decline rates are even higher. Even within the core areas, production tends to fall pretty rapidly from shale gas and tight oil uh, formations. Why? Well, you know, it's, it's partly, well, it's, it's, real, it's actually entirely a matter of the resource that we're talking about. Uh, we're, these are, as, as the terms indicate, tight formations. So there's very little permeability. The resource is there. Geologists call them source rocks. Um, typically, in the uh, biological material, uh, algae, plankton, that was deposited tens of millions of years ago uh, was, was cooked within the rocks by, uh, by immense pressure and, and temperature and typically has migrated from uh, often shale rocks into more porous rocks that are capped by an, an, uh, an impervious cap rock. This is a conventional oil reservoir. What we're talking about are source rocks that, where, that still retain some of that original oil, but those source rocks are dense and tight and don't want to give up that resource. And that's why geologists, 
who have known about these rocks for a long time have avoided them. But now that all the conventional oil is pretty much spoken for, these are the last worst prospects available. So the, the oil or gas doesn't want to flow. How do you get it out? By horizontal drilling to increase the contact between the well bore and the fuel bearing layer and then hydrofracturing, punch, punching holes with explosives in the well casing and then pumping in water and chemicals to fracture the rock or to, uh, to increase the size of the naturally occurring fractures so that the oil or gas can flow into the well bore. Okay, well the oil or gas that's close to that well bore flows in once you've opened up those fractures, but the rest of the rock still doesn't want to give up its oil or gas. So there's a, 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 a sudden or a rapid release of the oil or gas into the well bore, and that very quickly declines. So what's the implication of these steep decline rates? It means that the, the companies have to drill and drill and drill. As each well is drilled, produces, then starts to decline, it's necessary to drill a next well and a next well in order to maintain production rates. <clears throat> so here, for example, we, we see the number of wells, that's number, number of U.S. natural gas wells that are operating, has increased by 90% since 1990. But the productivity of each well has declined by almost 40%. Again, this is, this is indication of declining returns on effort. The city of uh, Fort Worth, Texas, again, where, where the Barnett Shale is, is uh, focused, received $50 million in revenues from only 44 shale gas wells in 2008. Okay, well, the industry was just getting started in the Barnett and in the Fort Worth area at that time. By 2012, there were almost 400 wells that had been dr drilled and were producing. But the city only received $23 million in 2012, less than half as much in revenue. Why? Because the sweet spots, the core area had been drilled out. The, the industry was already starting to move to peripheral areas, lower initial production rates, declining production from existing wells. This is a short-term bubble. The, the expectation, the claim that this is, this is a long-term trend, the shale revolution that will last 100 years or 200 years, that claim is not confirmed by the data. A couple of years ago, the New York Times published a story based on documents from the industry that uh, Times reporters had, had recovered, suggesting that the industry itself is skeptical of the longevity and profitability of shale gas. But still we hear the hype. It seems never ending. A hundred years of shale gas, cheap natural gas, where are these claims coming from? Well, it, a large part of it has to do with the business model of the shale gas industry. That business model is based not so much on actual production as on value of assets. Well, what does this mean? Well, actual production of shale gas in, in many cases is not profitable. Chesapeake Energy, which is the foremost U.S. producer of shale gas, has not actually made money on a net basis on production in any of the last 10 years. And yet, Chesapeake continues to be a profitable com com company. How can this be? Well, where are their profits coming from? Largely from sales of drilling leases. What's that about? Well, very early on in this whole process, the companies, and again, they tend to be smaller, risk-driven, 
uh, highly leveraged companies, of which there are uh, dozens, went out throughout these areas, the, the shale gas and tight oil plays, and leased as much land as they possibly could, millions of acres. And then they, once they had leased the land, they began talking up the value of, of these leases, saying that making all the claims that, that I just repeated to you, that this was a bonanza that would last for decades, that it was a manufacturing operation. You could sink a drill bit anywhere and come up flush. So as the value of the leases increased, then the operators, the companies, were able to sell the leases to larger oil companies, oil and gas companies like Shell, or to foreign operators in places like China, and make an immense profit on lease sales. And that's what many of these operators have been subsisting on for the last several years. They overproduced shale gas over the short term. And why did they do that? Again, to drive up the value of the lease sales, to, to underscore the perception of abundance. They also did it because the, the leases contained clauses, as all drilling leases do, uh, pertaining to uh, the you know, deadlines for drilling. If you don't drill within a certain amount of time, the lease uh, becomes null and void. So the, there are economic reasons for skepticism about shale gas and tight oil. But there are also, of course, environmental reasons. People who live near fracking operations uh, can testify to the bad air, often causing headaches, respiratory problems, nosebleeds, uh, problems with water quality, and these are now being documented increasingly. It's been difficult up to this time to document many of these environmental and health problems. Why? Because the practice of the industry is to swoop in as quickly as possible once problems become apparent and make a settlement with the, with the people, the property owners who are being affected, who are being impacted. And the settlement, which typically includes payment of, of money, also typically includes a non-disclosure agreement so if, if you want the money, you can't talk about what happened to you. So this makes it very difficult to compile statistics on environmental problems and health problems. But these, uh, the statistics are emerging in any case. <clears throat> Often the industry claims that the, there are enormous economic benefits to be reaped by communities from the advent of fracking. And certainly, uh, the subsurface mineral rights ownership regime in the United States has, to a very large extent, supported uh, the fracking industry. The US is almost unique in the world in that property owners also own subsurface mineral rights. Okay, so the, the companies have to purchase drilling rights from the property owners. And so this involves an immediate payment and also a royalty as the oil or gas is actually uh, produced. It's not, it's not the same in other parts of the world. Their government owns the subsurface rights. But in the US, property owners benefit Okay, so, so often communities are, are, are divided by fracking uh, from, though on one side, those who are, stand to benefit financially, and on the other side, those who are, are concerned about the environmental and health problems. And so fracking very often uh, tears communities apart. Meanwhile, the, the promises of tax revenues and jobs, the evidence suggests that these have been wildly overblown. Uh, many of the jobs that are, the high paying jobs that are created actually don't go to people within the community. 
uh, specialists fly in, do the frack jobs, and then fly back home to Oklahoma or, or wherever uh, they're from. The short-term jobs that are created within the communities and in, in service industries uh, <clears throat> actually are also associated with the driving up of, of costs uh, within those communities. The price of, of real estate and hotel rooms and, and services increases, so people on fixed incomes within uh, these boom towns suddenly find, find themselves uh, unable to afford to live in, in, their, in their old town. But it's also very short term. It's a, it's a boom town syndrome. Uh, over the short term, lots of jobs uh, in hamburger joints and jobs for pole dancers and, and all the rest because, of course, these are, these are, are very largely man camps that are, that are set up. Uh, gambling, uh, um, crime increase, and so on. And then the, uh, the resource starts to give out. Uh, the companies pick up and move away and the local economy is, uh, is left to wither. What about the tax revenues? Well, yes, there are tax revenues from production that go to uh, local governments and state governments, but in most cases, and, and uh, there are studies to document this, in most cases, the tax revenues are not sufficient to offset costs increased costs, for example, from road damage. Uh, it often takes up to 2,000 truck trips to, uh, to bring in drilling equipment, water, chemicals, and so on, and then take all these things away at the end of the operation for each well. So that's, that's a lot of wear and tear for local roads because we're talking about thousands and thousands of wells, individual wells. Each well, a couple of thousand truck trips. Well, what, what does that actually cost? Well, it, it, it turns out that very often it costs more in terms of road damage than governments make from, from tax revenues. Well, the, the natural gas industry now is talking up the prospect of LNG exports from North America, both from the US and from Canada. Of course, this has local significance because British Columbia is now planning on exporting LNG. Well, is this a good idea? Where it's coming from, of course, is the fact that uh, natural gas in North America is so cheap that producers are losing money on every BTU they produce. Uh, not in every case, there are, still, there are certainly still profitable, profitable wells, but increasingly in the shale gas fields as operators are being forced to the periphery, they can't make money with uh, natural gas at three or four dollars per million BTUs. So if they can export that natural gas as LNG to Japan or, or other countries for $10 or $12 a million BTUs, then there's hope of, of profitability. But then what happens to all of the promises that the industry has made to the chemicals industry and and to the, the power generation industry, and so on, of cheap natural gas. See, one of the payoffs to society from fracking for natural gas was supposed to be that we would have this cheap source of fuel. And for the last few years, it has been very cheap, but too cheap for the industry, and the in industry doesn't like that. So they're, they're trying to have it both ways. They're trying to have higher prices while still selling their service to society on the basis of uh, the, their ability to produce a, ch a cheap fuel. Then there's the question in, in BC of whether are you all going to be able to export LNG 
uh, cheaper than other exporters around the globe. Um, what will be the longevity of production? You know, again, we've been promised that there's enough of this stuff to last 100 years, but what if this is really a short-term bubble such that uh, shale gas production in North America will turn around even within the next two, three, four years. By the time we have the infrastructure in place for large-scale LNG exports, we may already be seeing declining shale gas production. Now let's, let's turn back to uh, oil. Uh, again, we see basically the same phenomenon as with shale gas. Very high per well decline rates. In the Bakken formation in North Dakota, uh, individual wells have a decline rate of uh, something like 60 to 70 percent in the first year. But overall, that, that decline rate gradually uh, goes horizontal. So in the second year, it's, it's a lower percentage decline. So overall, taking into account newly drilled wells where, that are declining rapidly and older wells that are declining more slowly, the overall production decline rate in the back end is about 40% per year. That means the industry has to produce an extra 40% of oil every year just to stay even. Globally, the annual production decline rate is closer to 6%. So you can see there's a big problem for the producers over the long term. The more wells they drill, the harder it is to maintain production. So we did the numbers in our study on the Bakken and the Eagle Ford, and it, it looks pretty clear that we will have a peak uh, relatively soon, probably by around 2016 in production from the back in an Eagle Ford. The, uh, the EIA, the Energy Information Administration of the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, generally agrees with us that these, these plays will peak out fairly soon, but the EIA f foresees a much longer tail on uh, tight oil production in the U.S. going out to the 20. 30s and 2040s. We don't see a basis for that. The EIA also sees a lot of tight oil coming from the Monterey Formation in California. Yes, a, there's a lot of oil there, but looking at the geology, and we did a, a pretty extensive report on this, uh, the, the geology is not uh, anything like the, that in uh, in North Dakota or Texas. It's highly folded and faulted. It's not amenable to horizontal drilling, so there are going to be vertical wells. The wells that already exist in the Monterey, the recent wells that have been, uh, the vertical wells that have been fracked have not been very productive or profitable. There's no reason to think that uh, the Monterey will be anything like as prolific as the EIA is counting on in its projections. So we are probably looking at a situation where because of the decline in conventional oil that I was talking about earlier in the presentation and the peak and decline in the tight oil plays in the US by around 2016, we're probably looking at a pretty substantial drop in world oil production beginning next year or the year after. Now, there's, there, there's a widespread belief in the energy industry that the, all of the talk about peak oil a few years ago was just scaremongering. Uh, peak oil is dead. But, you know, go back and look at what has been said by the industry and the agencies like U.S. Department of Energy and International Energy Agency over the past 12 years and compare it what, with what the best peak oil analysts have been saying and where does the data line up? I actually went back uh, and, and looked at my first book on peak oil, a book called The Party's Over, published in 2003. Uh, 
I was, I was working on the basis of the analysis of a, a couple of petroleum geologists named Colin Campbell and Jean La Herrera. And, uh, and I endorsed their, their views in my book, which were that conventional oil production would peak around 2005, but that would drive oil prices up, which would incentivize production of unconventional oils, which would in turn peak around 2015. Okay, so that was published in 2003. How close is that to reality compared to what we were seeing in reports from the EIA or the IEA in the early 2000s, which were calling for 30 or $40 a barrel oil and production increasing at two or 3% per year until the mid 19, or excuse me, 2030s. So is peak oil dead? I think not. Uh, I wish we had been wrong from an economic standpoint because this is going to be an enormous problem for society, for our economy and everything we care about. But unfortunately, it looks like we were, we were dead on right. How about the tar sands? <clears throat> Again, an enormous resource in place, but there are some problems with the tar sands. Obvious environmental problems, but also a, a kind of hidden economic problem that isn't often discussed, and that is that the energy return on energy invested in producing oil from the tar sands is pretty poor, about five to one. Now, that may sound pretty good. I mean, if it were, that were a financial investment and you could you know, invest $100 and make $500 back in any you know, reasonable time, that would be uh, you know, something to write home about. But in the energy world, it's a bit different. You know, almost everything we do in society uses energy, whether it's healthcare, education, transportation, agriculture, all of those things use energy, but don't really produce much energy. So that the energy that we invest in actually producing energy, whether it's drilling oil wells or building solar panels, that has to be really productive in order to fund all the other things we want to do. Historically, during the industrial period, the early industrial period, we were looking at energy returns on, for example, the oil industry, of 100 to 1, the coal industry, 80 to 1 or better, okay? With tar sands at 5 to 1, well, we're get, that's getting pretty darn close to the energy returns that were common in agrarian times before the Industrial Revolution. It may be profitable to the companies, the Suncors and the others that are, that are producing the tar sands, it may be profitable to arbitrage cheap natural gas into more expensive sin, sin crude. It may be profitable, but, but from an energy perspective, this is like turning gold into lead. The, the tar sands, like all non-renewable resources, are subject to the, the resource pyramid. The resource pyramid is, is just a way of characterizing any non-renewable resource. The, the bit at the top is the easiest to get, cheapest to get, highest quality, the fewest uh, environmental problems with extracting it. And then as you dig down through the resource pyramid, you get to more and more unconventional resources. Now the thing is, the, the un unconventionals are more abundant than the conventionals. If you can go far enough down into the resource pyramid, you know, there's enormous quantities of oil, coal, natural gas. But beyond a certain point, it actually would cost you more energy to get the stuff out of the ground than, it would, than the, the fuel will give you when you burn it. And then most of the resource is below that point on the resource pyramid. So it's true, we'll never run out of oil or gas or coal because we'll stop mining or drilling for it way before we get to that point. We'll stop because it doesn't make energy sense or economic sense to persist. 
Because Canada is depending so much now on the tar sands, there's a kind of dilemma that has emerged. The country still imports a lot of oil, for the, mostly for the eastern half of the country, and then exports tar sands oil. But it's paying the global price for the imported oil. And there's less than a decade worth of reserves of conventional natural gas and oil for the country. So there's really no good energy planning from a long-term perspective that's going on. The, the, the words that are usually used with regard to Canada's uh, fossil fuel resources are how can we develop these resources? But think about it. You know, the word develop sounds so good. You know, it's like you develop your muscles and at the end of the day, after you've exercised and developed your muscles, they're bigger than they were when, when you started. But that's not what happens when we develop non-renewable resources like coal, oil, and natural gas. We're not developing anything. We're just extracting them. We're, we're liquidating them. So when, when in my country we talk about, you know, drilling, drill here, drill now, my response is, yeah, let's, let, let's deplete America first, sure. <laughs> is, that a, is that good economic policy? Well, I, I've already mentioned economic, or, uh, energy return on energy invested, and a little bit more needs to be said about that because from an overall perspective, as we deplete the, the cheap conventional fossil fuels at the top of the resource pyramid, what's happening is that the overall energy return on energy invested of society is declining. For the US, it's down to roughly 10 to 1 right now. For the world as a whole, closer to 15 to 1. Now, are these numbers that we should worry about? I think so. Below about 10 to 1, we run into uh, what's called the, the net energy cliff. Above 10 to 1, you see there's not that much difference in, in practical terms between a, in, an energy profit ratio of 100 to 1 and 20 to 1. Still, you're, in either case, you're investing a relatively trivial proportion of society's resources in producing energy, whether it's 100 to 1 or 20 to 1. But once, once you get down to less than 10 to 1, there's a big difference between 10 to 1 and 7 to 1 and 5 to 1. Can we even operate an industrial society on less than 10 to 1 energy profit ratio? It, there, it's, it's actually doubtful. We begin to see more and more uh, uh, of labor going into the, the energy sector, more and more investment going into the energy sector, and jobs and investment in all other sectors begin to dry up. That's what we're actually seeing right now. Okay, what, what can and should we be doing about all of this? All of these are pretty daunting problems, and I bring them up to you not to uh, not just to be, you know, alarming and discouraging, but it's because it's important for us to know what's actually going on around us. These things are not being discussed, for the most part, in the public arena. Yes, we do hear about climate change, but how much do we hear about declining returns on investment in the energy sector, both financial returns and energy returns, and yet, this pattern of declining returns could be pivotal in uh, the fate of our economy. Well, what should we do? Obviously, we need alternative renewable energy sources. We need solar and wind, for example. But these are different kinds of energy sources. They're intermittent. They're not dispatchable on demand like coal and natural gas and oil. So it means we're going to have a different kind of energy future. Transportation almost all runs on oil. And 
there are only partial substitutes. Yes, we could have electric cars, but automobiles are inherently energy in inefficient. Can we have electric airliners? No, the batteries would be way too heavy. So the whole airline industry is problematic going forward as we, as we transition to alternative energy sources. We have to rethink not just where we're getting energy from, but how we're using it. In transportation, we need to be looking not just at different ways of fueling our cars, we have to look to alternatives to the automobile. We're facing a less mobile society, so how can we organize our lives and our, our dwelling patterns so that we can do what we need to do, whether it's working or shopping or, or growing food or whatever, while traveling less, using less motorized transport and more walking and bicycling. We need to make our buildings far more energy efficient, and certainly that's possible in Germany. There's been the, the passive house movement, uh, over 20,000 uh, commercial and, and residential buildings have been constructed that use almost no input energy. And that's just by sealing up the building envelope, uh, uh, increasing insulation, and then uh, providing ways for, for sunlight to heat the building and, and for uh, uh, solar collectors to heat water and provide electricity. Well, if, if that can be done in Germany, which is a relatively cold country, why can't it be done more in North America? I inquired today and, and learned that there have been only a couple of passive houses built in Canada and maybe a dozen or so in, in, uh, in the US. So building retrofitting and changing building standards is uh, an area where uh, enormous strides can be made. Then the food system. We've, we've built a food system around oil and natural gas. Natural gas for, uh, uh, to, with which to make ammonia-based fertilizer and oil to fuel transports to the farm to fuel farm machinery and then to transport out outputs from the farm ultimately to the consumer's plate. Something like seven calories of fossil fuel energy go into uh, growing and transporting every calorie of food ultimately to the consumer plate. That's a food system that's almost designed to fail under the circumstances that, that we've been discussing. But What's been happening over the past few years is the explosive growth of the local food movement. The USDA uh, tells us on its website that the local food movement is the most important trend in agriculture today. So taking fossil fuels out of agriculture, both in the form of reducing chemical inputs and also reducing food miles, is not only necessary, but it's also actually already occurring. Now, in, in many ways, the trends that, that are, the hopeful trends that are occurring and the things that need to happen are not occurring as a result of high-level government policy. Now, of course, you know, it would be helpful to have things like uh, uh, carbon taxes, and it's, and it's good to know that there, there is one here in British Columbia could be uh, much higher than $30 a ton. But things like carbon, policies like carbon taxes could help push this, this transition along much faster. But it's very difficult from a policy standpoint. Policymakers want more economic growth. And in the US, climate change can't even be talked about seriously in policy circles because you have one of the two political parties that denies that climate change is occurring, or if it is, because of, of CO2. So what is happening is largely happening as a result of the be behavior change on the part of individuals, households, and communities. And there's so much that can occur from the bottom up Village Vancouver is an example of that kind of, 
uh, community-based behavior change. As a society, if we can switch over time from expectations of more economic growth, from, the, from doing everything we can to make growth happen, even if it's imperiling the lives of future generations, if we can move from that model toward valuing quality of life, then we can make this transition go much, much easier and faster. Uh, and there are, even if we are seeing peak oil, there are a lot of things that aren't at peak. Things like a sense of satisfaction from honest work well done, intergenerational solidarity and cooperation, health of the environment, happiness and artistry. These are the things that make life worth living. And if rather than focusing just on GDP, we begin to think more about quality of life and target quality of life indicators, things like genuine progress indicator or gross national happiness, which has been pioneered by the, the little kingdom of Bhutan, then as consumption inevitably dwindles because of the factors we've been talking about, it won't necessarily mean misery for, for people. And if my concern is if we, if we don't do these things, if we don't focus on quality of life, then as economies begin to contract because of, of energy constraints and because of increasing costs from the impacts of climate change, the result is going to be uh, not just impoverishment, but also widespread social unrest, such as we're seeing in poor countries around the world where food prices are already higher than people can afford. So <clears throat> there are few of us in this room right now. This message needs to get out to a much wider audience. And we need to lead by example within our communities and support efforts like transition initiatives, uh, Village Vancouver, and, and show that this is, this is a transition that can be successful, it can be peaceful, and it can lead to actually some desirable outcomes over time. I salute you all for, for being here tonight and listening to a, a somewhat dire message in, in some respects, but you know, we are all in this together, like it or not, and I think we can, we can face these issues and have a good time doing it. So I, I look forward to joining with you in the effort, and uh, let's have some questions. Yeah, we're gonna just get the right screen and activate this mic and then we'll take some questions for about a half hour. Okay, so thank you very much, Richard. And I also forgot to thank uh, UBC Sustainability for the making this beautiful hall available. So uh, we have about a half hour uh, to take some questions. So uh, I guess if you just wanna raise your hand and I think because we're relatively small, I'll just walk this mic around. So, Natalie, you had a question? Okay. I have actually several. <laughs> so if there's no other volunteer, I can <laughs> throw them all out. Um, Maybe one at a time, because I yes. won't be able to remember more than one or two. Uh, how do you explain the low cost of natural gas, given that it has cost the producers so much money and they're losing money? Like for oil, well, it costs more, we pay more. Why did not this not happen with natural gas? Right, with natural gas, there was a, uh, a, a furious pace of drilling uh, over the past few years, and the, the, and the producers 
overproduced over the short term, they, and they drove down prices as a result. Um, I don't think that was their intention, but uh, in order to maintain their drilling leases and in order, in order to maintain the perception of productivity, the, they, um, they, they drilled faster and, and more than was actually in their own economic interest. And of course, they, they, wanted, to, they wanted to show you know, what these wells could do. Uh, and so, you know, again, the presentations I've attended, the, the, the mantra has, has been again and again, you know, the, the proof is in the production. Look at how much we're producing. Look at the low price. Therefore, you know, these assets are so valuable and therefore, you know, we, sh we should be given all sorts of, of uh, policy perks. Do I go to the next one? Okay. Um, a little technical one, but um, you had a graph at the beginning uh, showing uh, the GDP from the beginning of humans, or not quite maybe, all the way to now, and showing a huge increase. While I have absolutely no doubt that this is indeed the case, GDP has a new invention since 1945, invented by the Americans. So on what numbers are the rest of the graphs uh, right yeah of course uh, it's these these are these are estimates uh, but you know they're uh, they're, they're, they're certainly ballpark estimates and, and but I, I don't think anyone doubts that they're more or less accurate do we have other here, okay up here hi first thanks very much for your talk it was very enlightening and I was i um, intrigued with your example of um, your story about Chesapeake and how they made their money by selling leases. That's essentially how they are profitable on a net, be net basis. But I'm wondering, these projections that you're putting out there around um, natural gas production levels declining significantly much sooner than, let's say, the industry is projecting, they're, they're going to make their investment decisions based on looking at what the potential downside is. Like these are smart people that are projecting forward. And so I'm just seeing that in British Columbia, there's several major companies making multi-billion dollar investment decisions um, so in, in assets like pipelines and LNG processing facilities. How... How do they make these decisions with the potential downside that you're showing there, like with production volumes not being anywhere near what? The people who are making those infrastructure decisions desperately need the information from our report. And we've, we've made it as readily available as, as we can. Uh, if you go to uh, shalebubble.org, you can download a PDF of our 140-page report on shale gas and tide oil. It's called Drill Baby Drill, for obvious reasons, because you know, it's, it's a drilling treadmill that's involved in, in these production operations. And uh, the, the information is, is, is uh, clear, and the analysis is transparent. And uh, it's, it is increasingly being discussed in the mainstream, but it's uh, still considered, you know, sort of outlier. Okay, you have all of these, all of these people, the the IEA, the EIA, and the industry, forecasting, you know, abundance and cheap shale gas for as far as the eye can see, and these guys over here, a few petroleum geologists and and this nonprofit think tank in California you know, raising the alarm, who are you going to believe? <laughs> but, but I have to say on our, on our behalf, this is the most robust analysis that has been undertaken to date of shale gas and tight oil well productivity. Uh, we've looked and we have not seen anything equivalent from U.S. Department of Energy, from the International Energy Agency, or from any of the uh, industry-supported energy analytic companies. So uh, we, we totally stand behind uh, our data and analysis, and the, the data is, is industry data. So that, that's uh, uh, 
you know, uh, to be taken for granted. Just following along that line of thought, is there some sense that um, if we, if industry were to accept this data, accept this analysis, and start putting that into their messaging, their stock price would plummet? Yeah, and you know, I th we are unquestionably going to see capital fleeing from these companies over the next few years. When exactly the bubble will burst, I can't tell you, but it is a bubble. Uh, it, it, and it's all based on perception, as all bubbles are, it's based on perception. So as soon as the perception changes from profitability and abundance to, okay, the party's over, then investors are going to flee. These, all of these companies are highly leveraged. Uh, it takes a lot of money to, to drill. We're talking about low energy profit ratios and pretty low uh, operations profit ratios, especially for dry gas. In, in those cases, they're, it's, they're, as we've said, they're, they're actually losing money on production. So as, as soon as investors begin to understand these things, I think we're going to see a lot of people fleeing toward the exits. Um, you said it's a pretty depressing subject, and it is, but your talk almost seemed a little optimistic in that is it right to conclude from what you were showing that oil and natural gas companies will actually sort of run themselves out of business in the next 20 years and that maybe renewables would catch up in price even without a th carbon taxes helping us along is that like a reasonable yeah in some or? yeah in some ways this this is good for alternative energy if the investment capital is there for them you know if so far what we're doing is throwing more and more investment capital at resources that are showing ever declining quality and profitability. Um, that's, you know, that, that's a path to perdition. Uh, but, and, and, and one of the problems with that is that there, there isn't infinite investment capital out there to fund energy projects. And if most of it, the vast majority of it, is going to fund these marginal, unconventional oil and gas projects in the belief that this is, this is our future, in the belief that there's a hundred years of product there, then that means there's, there's less available for the renewable energy industry. This, this gets to government policy. You know, we've had in the US, President Obama go before the country in his most recent State of the Union address and basically parrot the industry line about the abundance of these fuels and the profitability and the benefits uh, uh, um, in terms of tax revenues and jobs and, and so forth. As long as that's the case, as long as we have this all of the above energy policy, then the, the benefit to, the, to the, the truly alternative energy sources, solar and wind and so on, is pretty muted. Uh, and that, so when, what happens then when we get to the crisis point where the fossil fuel companies start to fall by the wayside, well then that, has, that may have pretty dramatic economic impact on the rest of society, which in turn might cause investment capital to dry up even further. This is what happened in 2008, remember. So yes, there's the possibility of an upside there, but it's, there's no guarantee. And the more we can direct policy towards support of renewables prior to the crunch, the more insulated we will be from the, you know, the worst, worst case scenarios there. Um, so it, you didn't really cover it in your speech, but I was just curious to know, uh, like I, I read a lot about this 80% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions by 2050, or you know, give or take. And then there's other scientists that say that won't be enough. Uh, like I've done the calculation a few times myself, and at 80% reduction, that means a lot of people need to stop driving, just period. Uh, I get confused, I guess, like on an individual basis, P 
people still seem to make, be making decisions as if that won't apply to them. And from a leadership, you know, provincial, state, federal, um, that, like, leaders don't seem to be addressing this at all either. You know, they're, they're still focusing on this 20% number without really, like 20% reduction, without really saying how we're going to get the rest of the 60 or more percent. So I, I was wondering what you thought about that. Right, well, the, the, the problem is that policymakers are, again, fixated on economic growth as though human beings cannot live without economic growth, even though economic growth as we've known it is, is, a, is a recent phenomenon. Just in the last 100, 150 years, we've had you know, this rapid pace of ex economic expansion. Uh, we've become hooked on growth systematically for, for, to fund governments, to create jobs, and, and all the rest. So economic growth comes first. President Obama said, I'm all for tackling climate change. It's a big problem. Let's do something about it, but not if it hurts economic growth. <laughs> growth comes first. So this is, what, this is what's happening in the policy world. They're looking for ways to trim carbon emissions without doing anything to, to slow down the, the juggernaut. And that's hard to do because you know, economic growth has been so tied to fossil fuels. China has grown so much in the past couple of decades on the basis of really cheap carbon energy, coal. And India now wants to do the same thing. Um, can we promise the same kind of rapid growth from alternative energy sources? Well, it would be nice to be able to, and I know there are, there are people out there who are, who are doing that, who are saying we, we can make the transition to solar and wind and produce all the energy we need and more, and there will be no downside to it. We'll create lots of jobs in the process. It's only a political decision. I wish that were true, but the reality is these are different kinds of energy sources. And the fossil-fueled industrial revolution may, may just turn out to be a one-time only phenomenon in all of human history. That doesn't mean it's the end of the world, but it does mean we need to plan for the possibility of economic contraction. We need to plan for the, the reality of uh, that we may already be overpopulated on planet Earth, and, and it will be a lot easier to make this this change if there are fewer of us. So why don't we get serious about uh, family planning and, uh, and, and seeing if we can reduce po rates of population growth, especially in the poorest countries in the world where population is growing most rapidly and, and producing the most human misery. It's a, it's a human rights issue, in fact. Sorry, I strayed from the question, but... Um. Yeah, so I have a, my question is a little bit more on a personal level, I guess, um, because really it, it does come down to that, us as people and as communities and so on, um, making an, an impactful difference, right? So there's this, you know, there's this concept of sort of doing something bottom up or top down and, you know, the top down policy approach and, you know, uh, calling your MPs or whoever, you know, uh, to, to sort of uh, uh, implore them to, um, to take action and to be leaders themselves, which um, for the most part, they show very little of that. So uh, a, fr a friend of mine, he, he's, he bangs the, the, the drum of carbon tax, right? So I, I'm completely on board with that. I, I think fee and dividend carbon tax is ultimately really what, what slows this juggernaut down. But how does that really get done? And, and where do you spend your effort you know, as an individual, uh, do you spend your effort um, trying to 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 move something that seems immovable, or do you spend your effort um, blocking something that is is right there in front of you? Right. So what I'm talking about is, is sort of you can you can work in your world of of uh, you know I can I can spin my property and I can I can farm it and I can. I can have bees, and I can do all those good things that I can put in twisty light bulbs and, and so on, and I can, I can make an impact to myself personally, right? That, that helps me psychologically. But really, you've got to make the next jump, 
and what jump is that? Is that, do you jump in front of your, your uh, political leaders um, through activism or do you, uh, you know, and some people choose to do that. And this is a very personal thing, but in, uh, I'd like to pose the question to you. So, you know, th this idea that standing up in front of, say, pipelines or whatever right, and saying no, no KXL and you, you go to 350 org and you become part of that divestment movement and all those good things, right? Um, and you spend your energy there, and, and, or, do you, or do you actually say, well, that's, that's really not the solution, because then you're, you're sort of like going to the, the, uh, the situation where it's the war on drugs, right? And you're, you're really trying to actually block the, the source, but really the consumption or the desire to consume is still there. You haven't treated that problem. Um, and so, because you haven't provided a way from people to transition away, you know, into something and to, to follow up, they want to actually do is, is to get well. So, th this is a real problem piece for me, right? Because, uh, you know, for, for everybody, um, not everybody in this room, I speak for myself, but, you know, there's a lot of people in this situation. You know, you're a middle class person, you, you've got a job and so on. And you, you, uh, you've got to live in this one world, right? And, and, and you've got to actually exist there. But, but you don't really want to be there. In fact, you want to transition somewhere else. And all of the Village Vancouver movement and, and all of the rest of the transition towns, they provide a vehicle to do that. But is it enough, right? Are we just cushioning uh, the landing, the difference between a problem and a predicament? You know, as Chris Martinson pointed out to me a long time ago, you know, is in, in the case of a predicament, you're just creating a softer land. You just, you can't solve the problem. Have we moved from problem to predicament? And, and uh, yeah, so maybe I'll just let you talk to some of my ramblings. Well, clearly what we're doing so far is not enough. Uh, but what other options are there? I'm not sure. Uh, I would say, you know, both of the strategies that you underlined are important. And some people are, are inevitably going to be drawn more toward one or the other. There's no right or wrong answer there. And I think it's, it's impossible to say which is going to be more important over the long run. The, the lifestyle change, the individual, the community efforts, or the, you know, putting your body on the line in front of the the, the, the trucks on the, on the roads to fracking. Uh, we need it all, and more, and more. And the more creativity we bring to this, uh, the more we can uh, create a, an atmosphere that's, that's attractive and inviting to others to join us, the more successful we're going to be. Um, so I, um, I, I, all I can say is, if your heart's in the right place and you're moving in the right direction, more power to you, whatever you're doing. I, I would agree it's not a either or, but I think we're, and with transition, we don't say that that's the whole be all end all, we just say it's a, a piece of the puzzle. I think what we think is important is, it's this kind of imagine the possibilities piece and what would it look like and how do you model that because you know, it's, it's easy to be against stuff, and I think lots of times that's really important, but then what do we want to put in its place? And I think what we see is that that transition, you know, what we're doing now is just the very beginning of it, that there's so much to do, you know? It's like you plant your garden. It's one very little, little piece, and we want to get more and more people kind of in those habits of, doing that and we feel like we have to start somewhere. So for me, a context is important. Uh, and what we're trying to do is, you know, whatever you want to call it, shift the paradigm, create a new context, or I think we're, we're creatures of habit. And we just happen to, like as Bill McKibben has said, we, we have really bad habits that we've adapted, but they're not, that's all they are, they're habits. So we're trying to create that shift and I think it's kind of a slow process and the question is whether it'll be fast enough to get us to where we want to go but if we don't do it we're, I think we're going to be maybe that much worse off so 
You know, it's, it's all the stuff. I, I say that change comes from wherever we can get it. You know, let's just take it wherever, top up, bottom down, sideways. I mean, we just need everything we can get. So. Exactly, <laughs> wherever. <laughs> I'm back to probably a, a, one of those gloomy places again, but it seems to me that you know that we don't have 200 years to reinvent culture as we know it, and um, the forces on the other side are so powerful. They, you know, if you listen to Bill Moore this this week it was about the, the deep state. It, isn't, it doesn't lay in our hands at all. It lays in the hands of the people with, with, the, with the most money. And, um, you know, the, the power of, of self-delusion we, we saw in the financial sector. There's no reason to believe that, that the self-delusion in the economy, or the, in the energy sector, won't be um, as devastating when it, when it, when it uh, bubbles out. And uh, you know what's the what's the claim against too big to fail going to look like in that regard? These are the things that make me crazy because I think, <sighs> you know, for for as much as you can say that the renewable energy sector can't fulfill the all the energy requirements of, of the economies we know now, it could do a lot of it. It could do a great deal, and it would give us time to 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 develop more successful ways of doing renewable energy. And I don't understand why the why the why the financial shift is not leaving the oil and gas industry and 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 going to trying to find ways of doing renewable. It just seems. I, I mean, I cannot comprehend what it is that's standing in the way of that. It, well, it's um, <clears throat> it it is happening, but not nearly fast enough. And uh, uh, there 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 are some venture capitalists in Silicon Valley who've who've tried to make it happen faster and jumped in in, in ways that weren't particularly well informed and, uh, and they uh, got their fingers burned. And, that's, and I think that's actually been a, 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 a ca cautionary tale for, for other investors and that's sort of slowed down. The, what, we, what we need to, in order to develop renewable energy at the pace that's needed is government policy. It's that simple. Uh, all of the important technological transitions of the past 150, 200 years have been driven by government policy and subsidies in one way or another. Look at the, the, the hundreds of billions of dollars spent on building roads, which are effectively a subsidy to the automobile industry and the oil industry. Uh, trains, the internet, uh, atomic energy, you know, one could go on. The, it, the public investment in renewable energy so far has been paltry in comparison with these previous uh, technological changes. So there's every reason to, uh, to lobby for uh, an overwhelming shift from subsidies to the fossil fuel industry to much larger subsidies for the renewable energy industry but it's going to, it, you know, it is going to take a sea change to, to get us there because there, the, uh, the, f the forces opposed to that shift, including the fossil fuel industry itself, are still currently very powerful. Hi, Richard. I'd really like to thank you for being here tonight. And I really appreciated your message. And I thought there was quite a bit of hope uh, there that things can move to a a positive, sustainable world. But the real question that I had was referring back to your energy return on energy invested to maintain society. That number very much fascinates me and I'd love to hear what you think that is and what we could transition to. Redoing transportation, agriculture as you mentioned. What would a low energy return on investment society look like 
It, it will be slower, more localized, um, poorer from our, from our current st standpoint, you know, what we think of as a wealthy society and what we think of as a poor society. It, it's the, the, the low EROI society is going to look more like a poor society than like a, a wealthy society in our current terms of judgment. Um, <clears throat> Perhaps you could get into what a circular economy would look like, something circular like economy that. Circular economy, yeah, well, I mean, we, we need to become much more efficient in energy and materials use in order to make this, this work. Uh, it's not only oil that's, that, that is a non-renewable resource that we're using and, and extracting once and for all. It's all kinds of minerals and, and metals. Uh, so uh, recycling of materials as completely as possible is important, but, but also reducing the flow through, the rate of flow through of energy and materials is extremely important. Um, again, all of this gets back to the question of what is the good life? You know, it's possible to use a lot less stuff and have a, a slower, simple, simpler, and more localized economy, and yet have a much higher quality of life. And this is, you know, this is clear from historical and anthropological studies and psychological studies and on and on and on. So that's what we've got to aim for. If, if, if we're all convinced that we have to live in a 2,000 square foot house and, and drive a monster SUV to be a happy person, there are going to be a lot of unhappy campers around in a few years. I can hear you, but I, I, I couldn't understand what you just said. That not working. Hmm. Okay. Uh, speak loudly. It shows that it's on, but. Uh, okay. Might be the batteries. Okay. So we are on this terrible predicament uh, as far as resources, whether it's physical energy or others. Uh, but I was thinking. Right. Well, the, the truth is we're in for some very difficult times. Uh, there's, no, there's no getting around that. This is, we're headed into a, a period where a lot of things we take for granted are going to become uh, much more problematic. Um, and that being the case, what do we do? And what I've, what I've tried to do is outline some strategies and some attitudes that could be helpful in in making the best of what inevitably is going to be hard times. You know, human beings have known hard times before, and we got through them. Um, and it, a lot of it has to do with your expectations and attitudes going, going in and through uh, hard times. Uh, those of us in, in my generation, I'm a, I'm a baby boomer, I have to say that, uh, you know, my time of life on earth has been characterized by amazing stability, uh, ease, wealth, predictability, 
you know, almost unprecedented in, in human history. Okay, why should we assume that life is always going to be like that? Look back in history, in the Middle Ages, you know, famines were, were a common occurrence in, in, in most human societies. Okay, so we're, we're, we're moving back in the direction of what's normal human existence, a lower level of energy profit, simpler, slower. Uh, if, if our expectations are aligned in that direction, I think we can make this transition and maybe even do it in a way that results in, in some benefits, some real human benefits. Um, and I know the temptation is just to look at this situation and go, oh my God, you know, we're in for it. There's not, there's, and there, there are those who say, well, you know, human, humans can't even survive this. Near-term near -term human extinction is now guaranteed. So just, you know, kiss your loved ones goodbye and go and have a good time. I, I don't know what the outcome will be, but by golly, I'm, I'm going out partying, <laughs> Des, despite the title of, of my pre, previous book. I think there's a kind of party we can have under these circumstances that, that is, uh, you know, to, to call upon the best of, of, of human achievements and human potential in the face of great challenge. There's something honorable about that. So, maybe that's enough? Yeah, I think we're a little bit past, so. So, thank you very much, Richard. Yeah.